Hello, welcome to this launch event of the third series of the Formations series that is organized by Nottingham Trent University's Postcolonial Studies Centre and uh, the Bonington Gallery. My name is Nicole Thiara and I am one of the directors of the Postcolonial Studies Centre together with my colleague Jenny Ramon. Today's event focuses on Adivasi and Dalit futurism. The multimedia artist Subash Tebelimbu and Oshin Siva will be in conversation with each other about new dimensions that they introduce to futurism and how their indigenous futurism is informed by their Adivasi and Tamil Dalit identities. Today's event is also the first in a series of collaborations between the HRC-funded Kadal Fest, Formations and the Bonington Gallery. And if you're wondering what Kadal Fest stands for, my co-investigator Judith Misrai Barak from the Research Center Emma at the University Paul Valéry Montpellier 3 will now tell you all about it. In fact, Kadal Fest stands for Celebrating Adivasi and Dalit Literature Arts and Literature Festival. Um, it is a series of events and the first launch event just happened last weekend in Nottingham in person and live, but not online, but it has been recorded. Um, so it is a whole, a whole series of events that will happen between um, October 2022 and February 2023, starting in Nottingham, closing in Nottingham, but also uh, with a whole kind of, uh, a whole series of events in India. So we have been working with uh, different partners and wonderful people who are co-organizing and sometimes, you know, organize, sometimes organizing the events uh, in Goa, in Ranchi. It will um, include also um, a festival, a five-day festival in Adishakti near Pondicherry. And so, of course, we are all aware of the horrors of casteism, but this Kadal Fest series aims at putting the stress on um, the creativity, the, uh, the joy and the empowerment that can be derived from um, being together and sharing moments and different languages together. And I think before we forget, there will also be uh, another event in Goa, <laughs> organized and you know, dedicated as it's a workshop, a really kind of uh, a really exciting, innovative workshop that is led by Oshin. And there will also be another event with Subash. So um, that's all very exciting. But, you know, before <laughs> before I hand over to uh, everyone else whom we invited, um, I just want to tell you uh, very briefly about the moderators. You know, this event will be moderated by Professor K.A. Gita and by Priti Ganda Naik. Sorry, Priti. <laughs> um, and I just want to introduce them briefly, but because uh, uh, they will be introducing Subash and Oshin, but I want to make sure that they're also properly introduced. So K. Egita is an associate professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Bits Pilani in Goa, India. And her research interests are Dalit writing, post-colonial literatures, women's studies and cultural studies. And she has worked extensively on the literary production and reception of Tamil Dalit literature, as everyone in the field is, of course, fully aware. And Preeti Ganda Naik has just submitted her thesis on Dalit futurism. Congratulations. And this thesis discusses Dalit studies, science fiction studies, science and technology studies. And it's uh, from the parts that I have seen, it looks really fantastic. And she's currently working as a research associate at Tata Institute of Social, Science, Social Sciences in Mumbai. So about today's schedule, first, Gita and Priti will introduce today's topic and the artists, then Subhash Tebelimbu and Oshin Siva will have a conversation and at the end the audience is um, encouraged to ask questions via YouTube live chat. So if you have any question, you can start typing that in um, as soon as the conversa conversation goes ahead. And I would just very much like to thank um, everybody, Gita, Priti, uh, Subhash, Oshin, for doing this, for organizing this. It's um, it's a wonderful, it's, it's such an exciting um, event today and I'm hugely looking forward to this. So thank you very much and kind of handing over to Nita and Preeti. Yeah. Uh, hello, welcome to one and all. My name is Preeti Ganda Naik and uh, I'm going to be one of the moderators for the event. So basically this event is a conversation between the 
uh, stars of the art right now, Subhash Thebe Limbu and Oshin Shiva. And uh, both their works have imagined new and alternate modes of resisting caste discrimination through this innovative lens of futurism and speculative fiction. And we know that we only have to look around us to understand the widespread anxiety about difficult futures that don't seem so far away. And most of these futures seem to be rooted in technologies that seem both alien and alienating. And uh, the rapid proliferation of technologies in all aspects of life, social, economic, political, and of course, cultural, has centralized focus on reimagining and reconfiguring futures. And uh, this tendency to perceive and frame the future through a technological lens came to be known as futurism and first emerged in Italy in the 1920s. It gradually spread to other European countries and basically sought to cleave off from the past and prophesied exciting futures through new technologies. Uh, these futurisms, Eurocentric in thought and tradition, believed in technology as the new messiah and crafted technological solutions to solve race, gender, and all sorts of other social issues. So futurism at this point in time believed in technology as a value neutral phenomena and did not consider how it adapts and adopts both social thought. So this linear trajectory was interrupted by futurisms from the margins, which were motivated by different urges to question Eurocentric ideas about progress, about development, about scientific rationality and these so-called technological futures. Afrofuturism, Latino futurism, subaltern futurisms, indigenous futurisms, there's, there's so many that are now coming up and are being uh, and are questioning these Eurocentric ideas again. They are rooted in their own traditional uh, and own cultures and they intertwine the community's histories and beliefs with technology and posit alternate tomorrows, alternate futures with alternate visions and that challenge capitalism and industrialization. In the Indian subcontinent, we have artists Subhash Thebe Limbu and Oshin Shiva who have conceptualized Adivasi futurism and Tamil Dalit futures respectively. Oshin Shiva uses Tamil Dalit futures to refer to her art practice and co that combines futuristic designs with her Tamil Dalit heritage. Subhash Thebe Limbu combines his Adivasi heritage and science fiction tropes and refers to his praxis as Adivasi futurism. He is a Yaktun, uh, Yaktun uh, multimodal artist from what we currently know as Eastern Nepal and works with sound, music, film, performance, painting, and podcasts as well. So his works are inspired by socio-political issues, resistance, science, and speculative fiction, and indigeneity, climate change, and Adivasi futurism are recurring themes in his works. Um, his science fiction film, Ningwasam, is a unique take on futurism because it co-opts technology with Adivasi thought and not the other way around. Uh, I remember during one of the very initial conversations that we were having when we were conceptualizing this event, Subhash made an offhand comment, uh, you know, that we are all thinking about futurisms without being aware of others who are thinking along the same lines. So this conversation emerges from the need to place subaltern futurisms, which are multiple, diverse, heterogeneous, wildly radical in conversations with each other. Over to you, Geeta, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, um, Priti. Um, hi, I'm Geeta here, the other moderator for the event. Um, Oshin Siva is a multidisciplinary artist from Goa, a state in West India, where Oshin has set up an art studio. Apart from India, Oshin had lived in different parts of Asia, like Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. Oshin graduated with a degree in fashion and worked as a graphic designer and went on to become a multidisciplinary artist in 2019. On screen, probably you're now seeing some of Oshin Shiva's artwork. Oshin Shiva's art is a mirror of their own personal growth and provides a space to identify a voice and a place in the society. Rooted in a distinct Dalit and Tamil heritage, Oshin has perfected a signature style of their own using an amalgamation of many elements like surrealism, speculative, and science fiction. Oshin experiments with digital as well as traditional mediums. Their artwork imagines new worlds of decolonized dreamscapes, futuristic worlds with mutants and monsters, and narratives of cure and feminine power. 
Oshin has done illustrations for Adult Swim, Gucci, Levi's, Dr. Martens, and many more. Now you'll be watching a trailer of Subhash Tebe's film, Ningvasam. Anka kene kene wa de men ibna men thapna taim lam tiang ba Yemin ni wa ke ma ba wa ขอเลขเนกิเซคาซัมดังฮังเกมโจโก้เยเมปนาบาอิตาสุอิตโนโออิตโนเวมานาฮาโนเวซัมจุมฮาโนโมเวเวโจเคเนกิโกซุบาอ
because I mean it was the time when um, the um, all of our uh, say traditions and cultures I mean it's it has been kind of uh, what you call it um, say suppressed by the state I mean for the la uh, uh, for the last uh, 250 years since the um, uh, uh, since the formation of the state of mm -hmm. Nepal so so uh, I mean it, we did grow up in uh, knowing our heritage and uh, knowing our uh, traditions but not in a way that we could have if it was um, if it was for us I mean it could have been different so yeah I mm -hmm. mean uh, it was a small town and then uh, mm, I uh, what you call it the sense of belonging the sense of community was there and uh, uh, all those kind of things kind of uh, later on not in my uh, say a teenage years but later on in my life kind mm -hmm. of uh, played a huge role uh, those everyday kind of you know um, uh, ceremonies and rituals and dances and stuffs and mm -hmm. you could find those um, those kind of links in my work in some way or the other i mean i, I mean i'd be interested uh, to know about uh, you know the place you grew up as well i mean uh, if you yeah. yeah yeah um i oh thank you for telling us about that <laughs> but um i grew up in south india in Tirunamale, which is where my grandmother and my grandparents are from um we also moved around quite a bit um my family was in Taiwan at some point, and we also grew up in China and finally moved back to India about like, 10 years ago now, um, which is why a lot of my work has to do uh, about like finding out about my roots and what I stand for and like what my voice is. Um, so it was a very non-linear way of me getting into the art space. Um, I kind of worked as a graphic designer for a very long time graduated as a fashion designer, didn't do anything about it, like right after graduation. <laughs> um, so yeah, so my art practice really is like a way to know more about roots and family and like belonging and community and all of that. Um, speaking of, I know that we both are very much inspired by sci-fi and regular fiction, right? So it's just kind of curious about where that started for you and, um, how that kind of plays a big role in what you do now. I, you know, uh, uh, when I go back, I mean, um, to my childhood, I think the first uh, sci-fi kind of movie that uh, I mean, uh, stayed, I mean, uh, made a huge, what you call it, I mean, curiosity in me was kind of a, uh, um, it was a film called Terminator, I suppose, because I mean, when mm -hmm. we grew up, right, we didn't have those cable TVs and stuff like uh, mm -hmm. now. So I, I, I didn't grow up watching a, a endless episode of Star Wars and stuff. I mean, uh, we didn't have that option. I mean, we only watched uh, movies that were kind of mainstream kind of things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I didn't even know Terminator was like a sci-fi movie. I mean, I, I we watched it because I mean, uh, it was kind of action movie for us, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those kind of things. But later on, yeah, I mean, um, uh, how could I not, I mean, inspired by uh, Arthur C. Clarke and, you know, all of the sci-fi writers mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Isaac Asimov, I mean, like everybody else. But uh, uh, later on, I mean, uh, the most uh, influential and inspirational uh, works were from uh, um, uh, writers like Octavia Butler, right? So, 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 and it's uh, only been like five, six years I've been kind of uh, playing around mm -hmm. with these kind of um, uh, explorations that um, that uh, uh, people like uh, Butler, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. have been doing uh, for the, you know, last uh, 40, 50 years back, I mean, and uh, yeah, and then gradually, I mean, um, uh, taking cues from Afrofuturism and Indigenous Futurism, mm -hmm. I mean, 
and then uh, taking ideas from the genre that I always loved. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but not, I mean, when you say science fiction, I mean, we all know that, I mean, it's like heavily loaded with like colonial kind of, you know, they all talk about the frontiers, I mean, you know, the wilderness, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, just to uh, kind of uh, not get into uh, those same tropes, I mean, uh, I think we both are doing the same thing, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, trying to uh, explore uh, the decoloniality of uh, the, the, that aspects uh, through our creative process. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I see uh, similar, I mean, uh, kind of explorations you do. I mean, maybe you could talk about, uh, you know, your, your, your inspiration as well. I mean, did you it, I mean, uh, what sort of inspirations, I mean, uh, you had or, or while you grew up, I mean, uh, it could be different uh, from mine, maybe? Yeah. Um, Octavia Butler really does play a huge, like, was a huge role model with, with what I do as well, like, definitely. Um, but I also, I mean, I was quite a lonely child <laughs> growing up, so I was very into TV as well. And, um, yeah, just just cartoons like Jetson would amaze me and um, just sci-fi like animation, Ghibli for instance was a huge, uh, huge inspiration. And I think just not like seeing any um, characters that I could relate to was what I kind of wanted to try and uh, tackle with my work now as well, right? Um, and um, yeah, also comic books like Animation, animation, um, cartoons, comic books play a huge role aesthetically as well in the work that I do now. Um, and yeah, <laughs> we had a similar kind of similar upbringing. You know, it, this this it, I I think I read in your website uh, somewhere. Uh, you said something about growing up in a place, or was it your uh, uh, grandparents' place? I mean filled with loads of lights and stuffs, I mean, and, and, and I could see, you know, those uh, uh, fluorescent kind of colors in your artworks as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd love to know more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I did grow up in Velour and Tirunamale, both of them are in South India. And I don't know if any of you had a chance to visit South India yet. Um, please come, <laughs> if you do come to India. But, oh yeah, give them I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, basically, Colors play a huge role culturally in South India as well, um, which is why all of our homes, my neighborhood as well growing up, are usually very bright and colorful. Um, colors that are especially clashing are um, significant of joy and brightness. Um, for instance, like in our family, we're not allowed to wear black on like auspicious days, right? Because it's considered to be like not as festive. Um, so I do pick up a lot of my color inspirations and like color palettes from um, places that I grew up around. Or whenever I visit, um, visit home, I kind of like take pictures and pick up color palettes from there. Um, I'm also hugely inspired by like 80s comic books and things like that. Like Jack Kirby, for instance, um, I'm kind of inspired by like bright uh, comic booky aesthetic, aesthetics or, um, or like comic books or just artworks that I do. Mm. I think we can uh, talk more about uh, maybe, I mean, uh, you know, uh, say for instance, uh, what do you think, I mean, I, I'll tell about, I mean, what do I think about Adivas Futurism, but I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for yourself, I mean, what do you th think when you say uh, Tamil Dalit Futures, I mean, uh, I, I mean, if you can give a context on the word Tamil, because I may not know, you know, the context behind the word, I mean, for myself, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I could talk, I mean, in literal, yeah. Mm. So just a general, like, gist of what the word Dalit means, um, it kind of came from, came from, it's a Sanskrit word, it means broken or shattered, right? And the, the community is known as, like, the lowermost um, 
they belong to like the lowermost half strata. Um, and I, in specific, come from a community called Sariyar, who belong to South India. We're mostly from Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and uh, Sri Lanka. Um, it's the, the word pare translates to drum in Tamil. Um, and it is uh, believed that we were, used, we were essentially drummers who were hired for funerals or, um, you know, festive things for the royalty back in the day, just kind of the lineage in which I come from. Um, and for me, Summer Dalit Futurism is essentially, um, I see it as like a sister kind of school of thought of Afrofuturism. I'm like hugely inspired by Sylvia Butler, like I said earlier. Um, it's just a way for me to reinterpret and kind of reimagine um, personal histories, um, history from my family, um, history from the community, and kind of um, imagine a better future, um, one with more, you know, hope and um, solidarity, pretty much. Um, I'd love to know what Adivasi Futurism means to you. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, Adivasi Futurism, I mean, uh, for me, it means like, you know, the, uh, the reason I chose the word Adivasi, which basically means, I mean, indigenous in uh, both uh, Nepali and in Indian language. So mm -hmm. the, the the reason, I mean, I, I could have not, I could have just, I mean, you know, call it indigenous futurism. But the reason I chose to use that term was like, you know, in our daily life uh, back home uh, in Nepal, when we use the word, when we pronounce the word Adivasi, I mean, we just cannot stop there. So mm -hmm. Adivasi is always followed by the lead Mahila, you know, and we cannot just say Adivasi and stop there. So uh, whenever there's a discourse about uh, Adivasi, there is always a Dalit. Whenever there's a discourse about Dalit, there's always Adivasi. So those two are like mm -hmm. inseparable um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, discussions. I mean, uh, we cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, that's the reason that uh, I chose the word Adivasi. So mm -hmm. it could, uh, in a way, I mean, incorporate not just Adivasis because we're not the only ones marginalized in all part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, by doing so, I mean, uh, it kind of, uh, it I mean, I think it kind of uh, tries to encapsulate other marginalized community as well. Mm -hmm. So Adivasi Futurism is a, uh, is a space where uh, the people from Adivasi background or marginalized community could imagine a space in the future uh, where they have mm -hmm. agency, right? Or the, the, the way, the way you could imagine a future uh, where the uh, the praxis of like uh, colonialism, casteism, and capitalism kind of you mm -hmm. know dismantled. I mean, those are the, those kind of imaginations. So yeah, mm -hmm. Adivasi uh, futurism for me uh, it basically uh, sums up. Uh, our uh, uh, imagination uh, where we have those kind of uh, agencies in the future for me and mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, that's about it but uh, I mean maybe I mean we can talk uh, uh, say I mean for instance I mean f uh, for me I mean uh, uh, like I just said uh, when I say I mean imagining a future I mean I be I basically kind of speak from the, uh, you know, perspective of, uh, say, something tangible, something like, it's more to do with the kind of uh, sovereignty and autonomy than the mm -hmm. sci-fi gadgets and stuff. Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, science fiction is, I mean, is a beautiful tool, right? But I'm more interested in, like, say, uh, when I say like a future uh, for us, I mean I I, I, I imagine the land back, right? Exactly. Uh, land back yeah. to the people. I imagine sovereignty, right? I imagine autonomy. I mean, we want our nations where we have uh, a say to what kind of development projects 
should come there. I mean, it, mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. is that is that good for the community and those kind of things? I was wondering what what do you what do you kind of envision when you say I mean uh, cosmonadu uh, uh, and the, the, what 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 do you envision? I mean, you know, uh, uh, in your uh, kind of practice or your thought process? Yeah. So cosmonadu is actually one of the earliest work that I did. Um, on the digital medium. Um, Cosmonada directly translates to cosmos and nation. And uh, for me, it was just kind of interesting to explore um, characters and um, characters that were inspired by like family uh, from, from the past. Um, because we're, we were also like from where we are from, we didn't actually have um, cameras or anything like that back in the day like my parents are the first generation to have like gone out of the village and to have gone out of the country and um have all this um uh, resources right so for me it was kind of interesting to get oral history from my dad for instance and then kind of imagine what i thought uh people in the past would have looked like if they were in like a different realm um and you're completely right in that it doesn't have a lot to do with technology in my art practice either. I know that futurism uh, strictly kind of means like advancement in tech related things, right? Um, but yeah, my, my work also has a lot to do with um, just imagining a uh, world that kind of connects the past and the future um, of like hereditary, but also um, futurism I guess um, and yeah it, I, I would also love to know more about the, the documentary that you had made um, and what the inspiration was for that and how also when you mentioned land environmentalism plays a huge part in your art practice as well right um, I'd love to know what where that came from and what, what you want to like say yeah, the documentary you just uh, talked about, it's called the Ningwasum. Uh, the name mm -hmm. basically roughly translates as memory. So the mm -hmm. documentary has a lot to do with the memory uh, uh, and uh, yeah, anti-colonialism, I mean, the mm -hmm. land, uh, the traditions, the language, the whole documentary is in Yaktung uh, Limbu language. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, it's a, the, the whole project was kind of a, a not just producing an artwork but it was kind of a learning process for for me as well right so while i'm making this artwork i'm also learning more about my culture and uh, mm -hmm. i'm also learning the language as well because mm -hmm. i mean uh, when we grew up in that small town that i described earlier on i mean uh, our parents didn't taught us uh, our indigenous language because mm -hmm they thought we would have more advantage if we learn the national Nepali language or English right. language, right? So we would get right. better jobs and the opportunities. So, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, I mean, I didn't grow up uh, learning my indigenous language. So, I mean, uh, later in my life, I'm still learning my indigenous language and this uh, mm -hmm. documentary project, I mean, it kind of gave me an uh, opportunity to, you know, uh, learn and produce at the same time. So Ningwa Sum is a, a science fiction documentary. I mean, um, you can call it a film, you can call it audiovisual work. I mean, I don't know how to, you know, <laughs> classify these artworks. I mean, I, I don't it's an mind. an incredible to... piece of artwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, that's it, right? Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, screening in a beautiful event last night here in Vancouver. And mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, what, um, one of the uh, uh, our main organizing uh, organizing Pasangla. Uh, I mean, yeah, she introduced me as a director. I mean, which I don't mind as well. You know, I mean, I basically, I'm an artist. But yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, a science, it's, it's a science fiction documentary. It a uh, it has two characters. Uh, one character is from like a distant future and from an undefined mm -hmm. timeline who comes mm -hmm. to our timeline uh, and then kind of observes, um, doesn't try to do anything, but simply kind of observes the surrounding and then kind of uh, narrates 
us along the whole documentary and talks about the different uh, situations and scenarios I mean uh, that mm -hmm. we are now kind of experiencing and uh, yeah I mean uh, it's a um, I mean it's a uh, uh, what's it called it's something that kind of um, imagines that uh, some uh, futures is already there for us that we can mm -hmm. aspire mm -hmm. to right yeah. so, so, so it's basically the, the, the more about um, uh, urging us to think about you know what could happen I mean you know yeah. so 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 it's like uh, talking to us like um, if what would you do to get into that uh, timeline which is already there i mean um it, i mean i i don't want to get into that a deterministic future or uh, undeterministic mm -hmm. future kind of thing but it's it's basically it talks about um our responsibility like mm -hmm. uh, what are the, the um, how prepared or or to what length could you go to achieve that kind of future. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it's basically uh, my whole practice is kind of revolves around that uh, thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's about the documentary. I mean, I, 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 I mean, yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's I mean, what I love, uh, the, uh, love about the spaces, sorry. What were you saying? No, 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 you got it. <laughs> no, I was just saying, that's what I love about the space as well. Um, is that the possibilities are kind of endless, right? You're imagining something completely new, but I think it's also important to have it grounded like you do um, in your work so that we know like where different communities like can fit in or different um, communities are being represented, right? Um, which is what is lacking in like the kind of mainstream sci-fi in general. Like there's no, ex except for maybe like Black Panther, there's not really like that much happening. Um, visually where like different uh, diversity is basically being explored um but yeah there's, the there's that, hmm. yeah in the mainstream yeah there is kind of a, a loads of thing lacking but it, it, i i can i'm I, i'm really glad to see in you know in uh, non-stream i mean art and yeah. media kind of thing yeah there, there are loads of artists doing it i mean you know uh, yeah. indigenous artists from this total island where i'm speaking from uh, mm. and uh, afrofuturist artists i mean you know i mean it, it, they have inspired me i mean the audiovisual work has inspired me like uh, very much i mean uh, mm. the, the one name i usually mention is like this this palestinian um, um, artist uh, Larissa Sanso. I mean, she mm -hmm. talks about you know uh, the uh, the, uh, the future in the uh, occupied territory of Palestine, and mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, those kind of things. I mean, uh, yeah, but um, like you said, I mean, um, there is a lack of uh, those representations in the mainstream. I mean, apart from a few, like you named. I mean, yeah. Mm. Um, I also really wanted to know more about like the sound aspect of your um, works that you do. The chats and like sounds that you've sampled and collected, right? Just wanted to know like where that kind of came from and the role that that plays in your uh, Yeah, sound was like a, I, like I say, I mean, it was a huge collaborative process. And mm -hmm. that's what I love about this project. I mean, this audiovisual thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's not just me, I mean, you know, sitting in front of the computer. I mean, yeah. uh, it's like going out there and meeting uh, singers, musicians from my community, and then mm -hmm. asking them to kind of, you know, give their uh, input and feedback and how these things could be done, I mean, this way or that way. And same with the sound and um, uh, the chantings and stuff, the chantings that you hear. Um, in uh, my work, it's basically kind of inspired by the lullabies. I mean, I mean, lullabies mm. are considered uh, to be, I mean, one of the earliest kind of. I mean, it's it's just a, a hypothesis. I think. I mean, lullabies, uh, those kind of chantings. I mean, are kind of considered one of the earliest kind of musical um, uh, endeavor 
in human mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, like you know, it, you kind of sing. I mean, uh, sketch sing while you know putting a baby to sleep, and then later on, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it developed into few tiny words and then more words mm -hmm. and then it kind of developed to music and stuff. So, I mean, that's what they say. I mean, I, I, I'm not an anthropologist, but I mean, those mm -hmm. kind of things. And then same with mm -hmm. the, the, the tentings. I mean, uh, it's kind of inspired by the tunes that our grandmothers and mothers used to, you know, uh, kind right. of, uh, use uh, uh, to put, I mean, uh, uh, babies to sleep and those kind of things. And uh, uh, for other sounds, I mean, I used our traditional drums. I mean, uh, and uh, it, uh, and uh, apart from that, I mean, I used uh, electronic music as well, which I'm very uh, kind of uh, interested in. And I was yeah. fortunate enough to work with uh, Aisha Devi. I mean, she's amazing, mm -hmm. amazing musicians, and uh, Amazumi. And uh, Bishwa Sahib. Oh, I just met Amazumi. Right, yeah. <laughs> you guys are the residency together, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, Amazumi is like absolutely amazing. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and Amazumi belongs to the same indigenous community as I do. Incredible. Uh, and uh, so, so see, she also talks about her um, the, the ancestry, you know, in her work mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. I mean, you know. And then, yeah, I, I had a uh, talk with her and she was very interested and uh, supportive and then made a huge difference to the work. I mean, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, so it was kind of collaboration with um, the traditional uh, singers and musicians, but also with the uh, current, you know, electronic musicians and uh, rappers and uh, yeah, yeah, those kind of thing. It it was, uh, you know, a, a really great experience. Really great experience. I'm, I was I was thinking. I'm, I always wanted to ask, like, um, you know, um, the uh, what do you call it? The commercial side of things. You know, I mean, it seems like I mean, you know, you are doing quite well with the commissions and stuff. And I always wonder, like, you know, uh, when you work with uh, huge uh, institutions or popular brands, I mean, do, do was there any moment in your kind of, uh, you know, career that you felt like uh, uh, that contradicted your um, uh, uh, your, your, your philosophy and uh, and was there any kind of moment that you had to, you know, maybe I won't do mm. this, maybe I won't do that. I mean, you know, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, is it easy? See, for, my, <laughs> see, for myself, I mean, I'm, 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 uh, I mean, um, I'm not, I mean, I, I, I don't do, I mean, uh, I'm not into uh, like, most of the commercial side of the things i, I mm -hmm, don't have mm -hmm. an experience with that so i was i was wondering mm. i mean uh, to know about your experience yeah but you know the thing is i'm still kind of a baby in this field like like that uh like i said before i used to work as um oh, you have done a lot of commission systems <laughs> yeah but i essentially started over the pandemic actually like to do my own thing yeah to like start freelancing um so I guess at the beginning, I was just like, give me everything, right? Like, I'll take whatever, <laughs> just trying it out. Um, but I've been very lucky uh, so far to have, like, collaborated and worked with people that kind of have the same um, mindset in terms of the output. Um, I haven't had an experience yet where I'm just like, I don't know if I'm going to, like, work with you, you know? Um, but I am like still learning and like trying to choose, um, choose uh, thoughtfully. Um, but I mean, I, it's also very hard because a lot of um, there is no clean brands out there. Honestly, <laughs> like they all have Mars um, backgrounds. Uh, so yeah, I do do a lot of research and try and like pick collaborators and um, commissions in which I feel like I can give something. Um, I mean, the re I mean, the reason kind of in the same level. 
Right. I mean, the reason I'm asking is like, uh, you see, I mean, uh, it seems like we both are kind of uh, interested in um, uh, the activism side of our life, apart from the uh, creative practice as well, right? So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so for me, I mean, I, I don't uh, necessarily kind of relate my artwork, I mean, directly to the activism, I mean, because I mean, going out in the streets is totally different from uh, making a movie, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. I, which I kind of, uh, uh, you know, differentiate. And uh, yeah, people think like, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, some people might think like, you know, I mean, art can change the world. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, it can change the, uh, it has a lot to give to the society, but it takes really long time to achieve things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes in a fundamental way, right? I mean, the 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 the, the groundwork uh, uh, to change things, but it takes time. But activism is kind of different, and we both are yeah. kind of seems like you know interested in. And while doing so, I mean, I I find it uh, quite hard. I mean, um, uh, uh, you know, choosing to uh, you know to work with. Uh, so and so entities on so and so institutions, right? So mm -hmm. do emissions from so and so uh, people. I mean those kind of things. I mean, I, I find it. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I find it hard not to talk about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, so that, that's the reason I asked. I mean, you know, because you work. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm still <laughs> kind of. Yeah, 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 no, I get it. I get it. But I'm also like a full time illustrator and I'm trying to do my art practice like alongside this right um, and I'm always happy to kind of work with publications or organizations that have been working in this space um, to kind of help with the visual aspect of it to kind of enhance or explain what they're talking about right um, that is art archive for instance is somebody that I worked for recently um, the caravan is an organization yeah that's a lot of I just remember. <clears throat> Sorry, I just remember something. I mean, a, uh, a, uh, I, you know, this thing, um, the uh, what's it called? We there's lots of image making in uh, Nepal as well. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, depicting, uh, you know, um, Hindu goddesses as like uh, suitors. Using the image of Hindu goddesses like Kali and stuff. I mean, I mm -hmm. see some of the uh, images in your work as well. Uh, I was just wondering. I mean, how do you navigate uh, using uh, those uh, images uh, from uh, Hindu goddesses? I mean, that kind of has a link with uh, you know uh, all of the things that lead to casteism in a way in Indian subcontinent, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, including uh, my country, right? I mean, uh, I was just wondering, uh, how do you navigate yeah. with those kind of things? So I have actually only done Kali in the past, and Kali in uh, the Hindu mythology kind of has a lot to do with um, representing like the uh, community. Um, I'm actually not very into I mean, I don't usually kind of dabble in Hindu mythology um, in my work for the same reason that you had like mentioned, right? I'm also like very not religious. And, um, but my parents were, and they're like very orthodox, um, kind of believe in God. And that kind of put me off of it, um, which is why I don't kind of explore it in my work. Um, but it is kind of, at least in the illustration um, space, it has become kind of a trend to kind of reimagine um, gods and goddesses into uh, something else that uh, applies to uh, less right? Um, but I guess it's a way of reinterpreting and reimagining what the base is into something else. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, it's 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 amazing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if it if if the word is uh, claiming something that was not, uh, you know, uh, that was not there for uh, 
the purpose that we are trying to, you know, kind of put forward. I mean, I don't know, maybe it fits into that uh, 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 kind of uh, thought process as well. I'm, I'm, I mean, I was just uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, like curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, maybe, I mean, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Maybe, maybe we can talk about, I, I mean, we have some questions. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can answer some questions if yeah, there, is, there is. Or there is a question from Hida Albaro to Subash. How do people in your indigenous culture or community typically conceive of humans as relation to other species, and how do other species feature in Adivasi visions of better, more liberated, autonomous, etc. futures? It's there in the chat box. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Heather. So. Um, all uh, animated beings in our indigenous philosophy i mean this it, it's it I, I don't have to make it up this this uh, um, uh, those are the uh, uh, lines from the uh, oral traditions i mean the, all of the animated beings and uh, uh, or, or um, on an animated beings i mean they are treated equally so all the all of the uh, plants, flora and fauna, I mean, they have the equal rights in our indigenous philosophy. So uh, the, no matter, to, so every time you, uh, you know, um, you plant a crop or every time you kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, cut down the trees, I mean, you have to kind of, you know, uh, uh, ask for like, uh, an apology I mean uh, doing so and then you know only proceed I mean those kind of mm. things so it kind of uh, it's it's not unique to our indigenous uh, community I mean it most of the indigenous community in the world I mean uh, we have the same kind of philosophy towards nature and mm. it, it's kind of uh, interestingly brings to these uh, uh, new conversation around the world going on about uh, the rights of the river, rights of the forest, you see, the, the rights of the, I mean, uh, the, 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 um, the beings around us. And uh, 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 in Nepal, I mean, there, it, it, we don't have uh, that conversation as much as there is in Turtle Island in here. I mean, there are codes in uh, indigenous uh, community. They have their own courts as well. But I mean, uh, I was uh, listening to interviews of uh, the chiefs uh, in some parts of the indigenous nation here in uh, Turtle Island. And uh, they were talking about um, the uh, complexities of like, they have federal court and they have like in uh, uh, First Nations court. And then the, uh, even though there is no like a uh, kind of clear cut kind of uh, what kind of uh, agency uh, the community has, but there is something going on and there is this uh, conversation going on. And uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of uh, thing we should, I mean, uh, push the envelope, you see, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, we do what we can, I mean, in, in our lifetime and then uh, our, uh, the next person will do, I mean, uh, push the envelope, I mean, a little bit more further, I mean, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really uh, um, uh, the, 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 the idea of, like, uh, human relations to other species, I mean. In fact, I mean, most of the oral uh, uh, stories and traditions, I mean, in our uh, community, I mean, we see uh, other species as siblings. Like uh, we have oral, uh, uh, we have folklore and stories about uh, uh, many, I mean, uh, animals being our brothers and uh, sisters and siblings and so on. So while you have that kind of uh, mindset already that you see some other species as your siblings, I mean, you wouldn't think of, uh, you know, exterminating them for their skins or furs and stuff like that. I mean, because it's in kind of ingrained that it builds up your psyche, I mean, in your psyche that no, I mean, they are your brothers and sisters, I mean, you shouldn't do that to them. I mean, so I think it's really important, I mean, those kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, ideology to have, 
Uh, so yeah, thank you for the question. There is uh, one other question. Thank you, Subhash, for, uh, for that. Um, there are more, in fact, here. Questions, yeah. Thank you both. It is incredibly inspiring to listen to your conversation. This is Marina Rinsha writing from the on page on state channel. Then um, to Oshin, you said uh, this, mm -hmm. this question is to you, Oshin. You said you were moving a lot when you were younger and that your family has lived in China. I'm wondering to what extent you felt your Dalit heritage as part of your identity at that time. I mean, as I see it, one of the main reasons Dalits are aware of being Dalits is that they are marginalized in South Asia. So I'm wondering how, how far you being a Dalit was an issue at all when you lived abroad. Hmm. Yeah, this is um, the question. Yeah. Hey, so when I was in China, I was in middle school, so we didn't really like know too much about, um, my family didn't really discuss too much about our background yeah. growing up. I think it was a way of maybe shielding me from um, from just um, adversity, I guess. So we didn't. I didn't really know too much about like what it was um, when I was growing up. It's only recently now, which is kind of what I'm learning, uh, which is what I use my art practice for as well, um, to kind of figure out family history and like belonging, um, community things. So um, I don't know. Just being an Indian was different <laughs> in China I was like one of the two people in my class um yeah that that existed in China in general so I don't know if it had too much to do with just being Dalit um as it does just being like a brown person <laughs> in an international school in China mm -hmm. yeah I'm not sure if that answered the question <laughs> I hope it is. I think um, Heather Alboro says, a very fascinating and insightful. Thank you, Subhash, and thank you to Oshin. Both of your work sounds urgent and timely. Yeah. <laughs> so, Oshin, what's up? I mean, are you, are you working on something new these days? Or uh, uh, what are you working on these days? Yeah. I mean, I know you've been um, to Kathmandu uh, like recently uh, on a recent. Which was incredible. I yeah. think I love Nepal. I need to go back right. soon. Right. Um, I also didn't get a chance to expose too much. We were because the residency was in Kathmandu. There's just so much to see. I really need to go back. But um, currently, I'm working on. I have a show coming up in Jan in Delhi. So I'm working towards that. Um, I'm also working on a graphic novel, uh, which is like climate sci-fi graphic novel from India. Um, and yeah, one of the pieces that kind of came out of the residency was also a collaboration with this uh, musician, electronic musician called Noni Mouse, which is why I was very interested when you had mentioned um, electronic music as well. Um, we have a piece called Home Science that kind of talks about um, patriarchy and like growing up in a similar kind of uh, family background, um, which involves me painting and doing the visual aspect and no need creating music while we're doing it. Um, so we're trying to take that um, on the road as well. Yeah. How about mm -hmm. you? What are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on a new project. It's, um, it's with the Hyundai Art Lab. So mm -hmm. yeah, there are like five a Asian artists, uh, and uh, uh, we are doing an audiovisual work. So okay. yeah, I'm 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 doing something similar with uh, Ningwasum that I've uh, done, but it's not like Ningwasum Part Two. And, I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's not like a sequel or prequel. It's not a sequel. Yeah. Or yeah, and people are asking, oh, is it part two? I mean, no, 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 it's not part two. I mean, <laughs> there is, I mean, I mean, in my timeline, I mean, there is no part two. I mean, there is no, I mean, you know, uh, part one. Mm. I mean, it could be, I mean, you know, uh, negative one or negative three. I mean, you know, it could mm -hmm. be anything, but I mean, it's not, but, but yeah, uh, it's an audiovisual work, a short, uh, like 10 minutes audiovisual work. And mm. uh, yeah, I'm going to film it in 
um, my I mean uh, indigenous nation back in Nepal this December I'm going there mm -hmm. in uh, yeah end of November flying there so yeah and they will be kind of ready next year around uh, April maybe yeah and uh, hopefully I mean you know uh, you guys will get the chance to see it yeah, that's yeah. amazing. I look forward to that. Yeah, yeah, same answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are looking forward, uh, Subhash. Okay. There's one question from Judith, uh, Ms. Rahi Barak. Can you say a bit more about the comparison between Afrofuturism and Dalit futurism? How fruitful or constraining would such a comparison be? Either of you can take this. Mm. Yeah. So, for, uh, maybe I can go first. Um, yeah, yeah, I think for me, um, Afrofuturism and Octavia Butler and uh, that space was pretty much what gave me um, inspiration and ideas into how I could incorporate uh, my culture and my background and my love for sci-fi and how I could like kind of make that into um, an area that I was interested in exploring. Um, so I'm not too sure if there's a direct correlation, but it definitely helped me figure out my space um, and what I wanted to explore. Um, how about you, Subhash? I mean, I cannot speak for Dalit Futurism, uh, but mm. yeah, I mean, say for Adivas Futurism, I mean, I can uh, say uh, like the essence of uh, what Afrofuturism does uh, is similar to what we are trying to do. I mean, mm -hmm. it's basically if you if you replace the uh, the uh, word uh, okay. around, like you know. Uh, the marginalized people or communities i mean yeah it, it becomes these uh, the same kind of uh, uh narrative that we are trying to explore so i mean um, our lived experiences uh, might be different our lived experiences uh some of us are more oppressed than others but the the, the whole idea the notion of like how uh, this uh, this colonialism, this racism and classism, uh, you know, these kind of things affects marginalized people. I mean, it's it's pretty much uh, that's all uh, that, that we are trying to kind of uh, uh, you know kind of dissect and kind of uh, analyzing our practices or writings or music or whatever uh, forms that you uh, mm -hmm. practice in daily life, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I did mean to include Adivasi Futurism. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Subhash. As, as a continuation, I just want to ask you, um, so do you see Adivasi Futurism and Dalit Futurism in the same light? Or is it going to be, do you think that there is some kind of a difference between the two? In terms so, of politics and in terms of the way it is playing out now, politics? No, I mean because we we are kind of uh, the the state, uh, the the the, um, the infrastructures, the states that kind of oppresses the marginalized community. I mean they have the same um, kind of uh, it's the same thing. So yeah. yeah we are fighting the same kind of entity right so yeah, uh, yeah politically no but uh, mm -hmm. for the lived experience like i said so i'm an indigenous person from eastern nepal right from a yakting nation and mm -hmm. uh, i can only speak about i mean uh, from an indigenous perspective but having said that we are also affected by casteism yeah. you know mm -hmm. And it, we had no caste kind of thing, this casteism kind of thing in our indigenous culture, right? Okay. But since uh, our Yakhtun nation was kind of assimilated in the state of Nepal, I mean, mm -hmm. they kind of um, forced us into this kind of uh, caste and those kind of um, uh, evils of, you know, I mean, societies and so, yeah, I mean, we are not, uh, 
but we are not uh, um, isolated in this kind of uh, oppression. So uh, even in uh, indigenous community, I mean, there is casteism because of the last 250 years of this uh, this state um, policies and stuff. So uh, I cannot think about the um, uh, liberty of indigenous people without uh, imagining the liberty of Dalits and other mm -hmm. marginalized yeah. communities. Yeah. So th that's the main thing. I mean, I cannot say uh, freedom for indigenous people without saying freedom for uh, mm -hmm. Dalit friends. But as an indigenous person, uh, I mean, I can only support and be on the, I mean, uh, you know, a uh, supporting hand. Uh, and try to include as much as I could uh, in my practice, um, touching upon uh, our Dalit friends. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's how I see it. That's how I see it. Any other questions? I have a question for both uh, Subhash and Oshi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I was so excited for this conversation. It's like everything that I imagined it to be, it's been more than that as well. So um, uh, when uh, Subhash, this question is for you. So um, the way the movie plays out, the way the film plays out, uh, there is this constant uh, sort of tug of war between challenging timelines, right? Like uh, saying that, you know, uh, challenging the linearity of time as we all know it, that uh, this idea about categorizing it as past and present and future is something that is very, very superficial and is a construct. So um, I just wanted to uh, know a little bit more about what other, uh, you know, what other specific uh, things uh, from your own community life and your own community philosophy have you incorporated into the film? So that was uh, the question for Subhash and Oshin. Should I say it now or should I say it later? Uh, you, you can say it now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other uh, the question that I had for you was uh, yours. Uh, your, the Tamil Dalit futures that you're talking about is slightly more personal, and mm -hmm. because you're using the mode to sort of know about your own personal history. So I was just mm -hmm. wondering talk about one artwork that you have that really helped you articulate exactly what you were thinking and in terms of you know caste resistance and futures futurism as well so yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah uh, either of you can answer first Oshin you can go ahead I can. Mm. <laughs> uh, that's a good question thank you baby I think um If I had to choose one artwork, kind of difficult, but I would say my first solo show um, in Florissant did very much touch upon the idea of um, kind of kinship and sisterhood and solidarity and uh, imagining a world in which we exist with um, equality, right? And there is one there, there is one piece of artwork in there where there are different characters um, sitting on the side braiding each other's hair, and um, for me that has a lot to it reminds me a lot of um, home um, and childhood, and it's just the idea of like intimacy is so evident in how like your grandparents. Did you like your mom's hair and like how your mom did mine? Um, my mom did mine, not your mom. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that kind of idea is what I'm trying to capture in this world that I'm imagining, right? Just um, yeah, the idea of like kindness and um, shit. Right. I, th I, I think... about, yeah. Yeah, it, in my work, in my uh, science fiction documentary, apart from this uh, tug of war between, like you said, I mean, uh, the linearity of time, <clears throat> time or the other way around, I mean, uh, apart from that, I mean, I have uh, tried to uh, use uh, many kind of uh, traditions and uh, practices 
of our community in the film. I mean, there's a lot of things, uh, including like say the most um, uh, significant for me would be like the uh, uh, weaving tradition of our grandmothers and mothers, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. so uh, it's uh, like most of human. I mean, uh, human um, civilization is not unique to us, but it's something that kind of um, it, it's that something's close to uh, our community. I mean, you know, um, our grandmothers and mothers. So uh, the, the weaving thing. I mean, I've taken that uh, imagery and uh, the act of weaving. And kind of uh, like fused it with the science fiction kind of thing. Like say, I mean, if time is not linear, if time is uh, not kind of, if time is kind of not rigid but ductile, that you can weave. I mean, how would you weave time? I mean, you know, what patterns would you weave? I mean, what sort of uh, imagery would you like to make? I mean, those kind of things that I wanted to, uh, I was interested in. And um, the other was like, say, the storytelling uh, of our community. I mean, uh, the storytelling is a bit really huge uh, kind of uh, a part of our uh, indigenous culture. I mean, uh, the, um, the, there's this uh, thing called the mundum. I mean, uh, it's basically an oral tradition passed down from generations and generations. I mean, it kind of uh, tells us like, what do you do when a child is born? Like, there is this part in my uh, documentary, like uh, at the end, like uh, when you give blessing to a newborn baby, I mean, what do you do? Those kind of things, I mean, you know, aspirations for the futures and stuff. I mean, I, so I've included those kind of things as well, and a little bit of kind of, uh, um, say, uh, the music as well. I mean, what kind of music, I mean, would you uh, relate to? And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are many things, I mean, you know, apart from, uh, yeah, uh, the, the notion of time and memory, yeah. So I think uh, we just almost come to the end of the, event and thanks a lot uh, Oshin and Subhash for this very enlightening discussion on Dalit futurism. Thanks for taking us through your personal experience, lived experiences and then your specific Dalit and Adivasi politics behind your artwork. I think this conversation was very very important for us on two grounds. One is of course uh, the rapid technological transformation that the countries within the subcontinent are going through now, and then how Dalitness mm -hmm. and uh, how uh, um, Adivasi or indigeneity will play, will, will play out in the futuristic worlds, not only in the present, but also in the futuristic worlds. That is one thing. Another thing is, of course, uh, within the academic world, because some of us are from the academia, and then uh, uh, Preeti started working on uh, science fiction and uh, caste and gender in the futuristic world. And we were wondering whether this is just at the nascent stage but then your work, I mean, we read about uh, Oshin and you and then and Subhash, and then we had this kind of an affirmation, okay, this is just going, it'll, be, it'll get us going. And then now we know that this is going to emerge as a very, very niche area within not only um, Dalit studies, but also within Adivasi and post-colonial studies, probably. So thanks a lot uh, for this opportunity to listening to you, for giving us this opportunity to listen to you, and then for this wonderful evening. Thank you.